So welcome everyone. Tonight we're going to get to know our state tree, the cabbage palm with John O'Miller. Tonight's event is being hosted by the Environmental Conservancy of Northport. We're a 501c3 nonprofit land conservancy focused on the acquisition of land in Northport and surrounding areas for the preservation and protection of and education about our local area natural habitats, flora and fauna to include the threatened gopher tortoise and the Florida scrub jay. Since our launch in February of 2020, we've been focusing our land acquisition efforts in a neighborhood of Northport that hosts an active population of the Florida scrub jay, along with the northern quail and gopher tortoise. But our ultimate goal is to obtain and conserve undeveloped parcels in all neighborhoods of the city and surrounding areas, Harbor Heights, Port Charlotte, Inglewood, and beyond, in an effort to create a balance between development and our local environment. Our Harbor Heights chapter is now active and other chapters are in the planning stages. To learn more, visit our website, ecnorthport.com or look us up on Facebook or Instagram. John O'Miller is a natural historian, environmental educator and activist who has worked for half a century to understand and protect the wild places in Southwest Florida. The more John O learned about cabbage palms, the more unanswered questions he discovered. That led to his master's thesis in Florida studies program at USF in St. Petersburg. 10 years later, after traveling around the coastal Southeast investigating this common but poorly understood palm, the University Press of Florida published his book, The Palmetto Book, Histories and Mysteries of the Cabbage Palm. The Cabbage Palm helps make up our local area's native tree canopy together with the slash pine and live oak. And unfortunately, of the three trees, it is the one that remains most largely misunderstood. Tonight, Jono will tell us about the histories and mysteries of this beautiful native tree and help us to better recognize the importance of its conservation in our landscape. So Jono, you can take it from here. Mute myself and try to get set up here. Okay, so, um, okay. It's, I'm gonna stop sharing and come back at it a different way. Let's see here. Um, back to you, start share. Keep your fingers crossed. There you go. Here we go. So um, yes, I have written a book and I will talk about it at the end, but this is not a, an author reading passages from the book type of presentation. This is really just what it says, which is an introduction to uh, the cabbage palm. And so I'm gonna start with some basics. Uh, the cabbage palm, it's a scientific name is sable palmetto and it's in the palm family. And we'll talk more about that later. If people are familiar with uh, palm trees, the, the sort of iconic palm that most people are start with um, is the coconut palm and a coconut palm the canopy has very conspicuous individual fronds that they're, they're very quite distinct the fronds are feather like and the technical term for that is pinnate typically you can see the scars around the trunk where the leaves or the fronds were attached they frequently lean uh, they typically are fatter at the base and get skinnier as they go up and they're typically found in coastal settings and that's compared with the cabbage palm. The cabbage palm has a, a denser, more spherical canopy. It can sometimes be hard to see the individual leaves. The fronds are called costa palmate, and I'll explain that later. The leaf scars are typically kind of hard to see. The tree is typically vertical, although you can find it in just about any orientation. The trunk typically does not taper, and they can be found both right along the coast and also inland all the way across the state. So the historic range of the cabbage palm was peninsular Florida up the east coast to the southernmost tip of uh, North Carolina, but not as far west as um, the um, Florida border on the Gulf Coast. It's believed that they could live in a much uh, broader area, potentially. I think this illustration is a little exaggerated, but if you go to iNaturalist uh, and, and look at their map, this is where people have reported uh, finding cabbage palms. Now there are two other sable species that are found in Florida. One is sable atonia. This is sort of in a garden setting, uh, but it's typically a scrub plant. It grows in uh, 
white, well-drained sandy soils in the scrub, and it seldom, if ever, develops a trunk. It's, it stays low. And likewise, the swamp palmetto, sable minor, is found in wetland areas, and it also seldom develops a trunk. Now I mentioned costa palmate. The cabbage palm has an organ on its frond called a costa. It's sort of a spear-shaped point. And that's where all these different leaflets or leaf segments are attached. And because of the, that structure being there, there are many more leaflets that can be attached than you would see on, say, a saw palmetto. So that's why the, the fronds are, are, have so many different ribs to them. And they have what are called boot jacks, and that's confusing to people. The boot jacks are these spiky remnants of the leaves that uh, frequently encircle the trunk. They're very distinctive. And if you have a windstorm, uh, you can see all of these are pointing in the same direction. Typically, in a windstorm, the, uh, the part of the leaf where it's snapped off points in the direction that the wind came from. That's just how their aerodynamics work. And this is a demonstration of how to use a boot jack. Jono, I'm just going to interrupt you really quick. Sure. I failed to say after I clicked record that yes. if anyone has any questions as we go along, please go ahead and type them in the chat. Sorry about yes, that. Yes, that'll be fine. So in Florida, if we want to take our boots off, we can just find an old cabbage palm boot jack and step on one end of it and pull the boot off. Elsewhere in the U.S., they have to manufacture boot jacks, and they're a real thing. So uh, it confuses a lot of people. The cabbage palm comes in two different forms. One is when the boot jacks are still surrounding the trunk, and the other is when they've uh, fallen off. And so the ones that are still have their boot jacks are called booted, and the ones that are, don't are called slick if you go to buy one. So uh, what's distinctive about the cabbage palm leaves is that they die and just stay in place. They don't fall off quickly. They have to eventually uh, basically rot away or get burned off. So the leaves are kind of interesting in how they're arranged. If you see on the right, sometimes it looks like all the um, fronds are lined up, um, but actually each frond really comes off roughly 135 degrees uh, uh, rotated from the previous uh, frond. So if you look at the green ones there, uh, how they spiral around. Uh, the, the number seven one is not particularly close to the number eight one. So common mis misconception is that palms are grasses. Um, you can find plenty of places online that will tell you that palms are grasses. Um, that's part of what's not great about the internet. Uh, if you had the old golden nature guide when you were growing up, as I did, they would have an illustration of the monocots and you can see the palms are in one family and the grasses are in the other family, another family. So it's pretty common that people say that uh, palms are grasses. It makes as much sense as saying pineapples are cattails uh, or uh, lilies are orchids. They're in completely different plant families. It's just that they're both monocots is what people are trying to get across and don't always make it that far. Cabbage palms are really long lived, at least 200 years they can live and they're very slow growing. Here's a photograph that was taken at New College, you know, when it was still a Ringling Mansion in 1943 or 1944. And then I tried to go back and stand in the same location to take this uh, subsequent photograph in 2018. So 75 years separate those two photographs and yet you can see it's only gotten up really to the second uh, story. Uh, contrary to rumor, cabbage palms can produce a lot of shade. Uh, there are a number of articles that have been coming out recently about uh, cities that are cutting back on the, a number of palms they're planting for different reasons. But one of the reasons they cite is that they're not producing enough shade. Um, but the fact is they're simply not planting them close together enough. So here's, a, here's shade from a single cabbage palm. Here's a, a smart guy at Walmart. People know it, the true sign of a Floridian is a, someone who parks in the shade rather closest than closest to the front door of the Walmart. And you can see they're actually producing shade. 
And this is a picture from the Canopy Walkway at Mayak River State Park. And this is a place down in Glades County called Boar Hammock. And uh, you cannot see the ground. It's just complete uh, dense cabbage palm canopy. So um, what, what we get lulled into is when people specify replanting of trees, they'll talk about how many stems or how many trunks. They'll say, well, you have to plant this number of trees. Well, no one really cares about the number of the trees. What people care about is how much shade they're producing. So if instead of specifying uh, that we want you know, one, one tree or two trees to replace every tree, we should be saying, we want this many square feet of shade within five years and however you can get that, go for it. And then we could, we could see palms being planted more frequently because they do produce a lot of shade. Cabbage palms are routinely over pruned. Uh, this is where my mother-in-law lives. This is in St. Augustine, and this is a very abusive um, practice. And now we have the audience participation segment. Now this takes about four minutes. So if you need to go check something in the oven, you can do that. But what I'm gonna ask you to do is watch the next scene, this little video. And I want you to count how many green cabbage palm fronds are being cut off this tree. This is at the Sarasota Downtown Library. So you can ignore the brown fronds, you can ignore the uh, bloom stalks, but just kind of try to keep track of how many are cut off uh, to gain an appreciation of just how much of the tree's total photosynthetic capacity is being eliminated in a short time. So here it goes.
Okay, so I got 35. I get a different number every time I watch it. But the point is, they're removing the vast majority of all the living leaves on the tree. You would never consider doing that with an oak tree or a maple tree or any other tree. So it really cuts into the um, productivity of the plant. And if you watched, if you probably noticed, there's several occasions when he was using a single hand, holding the chainsaw with one hand. I believe that's an OSHA violation. So um, this is a really uh, uh, bad practice. And luckily the standards have changed. I'm about to talk about that. John, I'll tell you that in the chat, uh, there yes. were some guesses, 42, 39, yeah. and 25. Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to tell. They go by really fast. Some are on the backside. Sometimes it's hard to tell a brown one from a green one. But what remains is the fact that they're really taking uh, the vast majority of the living sustenance of the tree away. Oh, now it doesn't want to advance. Oh, here we go. Um, so historically, the American Society of Arboriculture, which are a group of arborists that try to develop professional standards the way professional organizations do, and they had a policy that you should not remove any frond uh, above a horizontal plane. They called it nine o'clock to three o'clock. And so they would have illustrations in their documents that look like this. Do not remove live healthy fronds above the horizontal. Uh, but they also said um, that you could, you could remove more, um, that you shouldn't remove green fronds at all, but so they were sending this mixed message. And uh, what happened is they revised these pruning standards in 2017, and now there's no mention of this nine o'clock to three o'clock stuff. What it says now is that you're, you're only the only reason to remove a green frond is for clearance. So if it's blocking your sidewalk, your driveway, a road, if it's touching a building, if it's near a power line, sure, go ahead and cut all the green fronds you want. But um, that's just for clearance. Uh, you're not supposed to remove green fronds for any other reason. So these are the standards, the, the official standards adopted by the governing organization. And if you see people that are pruning green fronds away that are not for clearance, as we saw in that video, uh, they are not following the adopted professional standards. And when challenged, these people will say, well, we're just doing what the owner wants us to do. Uh, well, that may be true, but they should, they should at least be telling the owner that they're being asked to violate professional standards for their industry. So uh, there's again an example of an over pruned palm and uh, the, the recommendation is to allow them to have their full natural spherical canopy. And when you remove so many fronds, it makes them more susceptible to disease, more susceptible to cold, more susceptible to strong winds. Uh, and it takes away uh, the uh, tens of thousands of flowers that they have that pollinators rely on and takes then they don't when they prune the uh, flower stalks off, then you don't get the seeds that a lot of wildlife um, depend on. So IFAS, uh, which is the outfit out of uh, University of Florida, says some palm trees don't need to be pruned like our native cabbage palm. It automatically sheds its dead leaves. So cabbage palms are remarkably tough as a tree. Um, they are fireproof, floodproof, fr frostproof, and according to research that was done after that really bad hurricane year, a, a lot of um, extension agents went out and took photographs of what trees did well and what trees were heavily impacted. And they concluded that the cabbage palm was the most wind resistant native tree. So here's a shot of a fire burning through a palm hammock. Here's another image and these, all these palms will survive. This is a really interesting shot I took up on Egmont Key. And so a fire had gone through this palm hammock on Egmont Key and then there'd been a storm event that washed white sand in through the hammock. So it looks like they're in snow, but you can see all the palms are re-sprouting and there's no other vegetation to be seen. They're flood tolerant uh, and this, this could easily uh, be a scene uh, in the estates in Northport right now. This is the Mayaka River. 
uh, the banks of the Mack River. And every year the Mack River leaves its banks and the live oaks and the cabbage palms tolerate that. Um, they don't have a problem with it. There are very few trees that can survive in those conditions. And um, the cabbage palm is one of them. And this is what that book that I mentioned was called Stormscaping, if you're interested in it, and by Pamela Crawford. And uh, they found that even after Hurricane Andrew, 93% of the cabbage palms were intact. And I went to Cabbage Key after um, Charlie came through, which really went right over Cabbage Key. And yeah, we found some palms that had snapped off, but most of them were still standing. This is a photograph from the stormscaping book. You can see on the right, a um, live oak that's had all of its twigs and leaves stripped off and next to it, a cabbage palm. It's kind of busted up. It doesn't look great, but the leaves are all there and it will recover. It's not clear that the oak will, might, might not. You can see more cabbage palms in the background that look even better. And here's a former president. Uh, this is in the panhandle after Michael, I think, and you can see the pine trees have had all their needles stripped. And again, the cabbage palm retains its leaves. Uh, there's no cold weather that we'll see in Florida that will harm a cabbage palm. They, they can take uh, pretty low temperatures. And as I said, they, they, they're growing them in North Carolina. So. And this is a little clipping I found after the hard freeze that they had in Texas. And they're talking about the Texas uh, sable palms bouncing back, but other palms are struggling. Now, despite being tough, they are threatened by a new disease called lethal bronzing, and you need to know about this. A lethal bronzing is very strange. You see these two dead trees, two dead trunks, and then the, the collapsed leaves of the two more. And yet, if you pan down, there are other seemingly healthy uh, green ones in the same location. So it doesn't immediately affect or infect all the trees in an area, but it's hard to tell how, how far it will go. This is the gentleman, Dr. Bader, who is uh, leading the research on the lethal bronzing phenomenon on the disease. And uh, lethal bronzing was first identified in Texas in 1980. At, it became known as Texas Phoenix Palm Decline. That's how, what they named it as a common name. It was first found in Florida around 2006. And it's similar to a bacteria, but technically it's called a phytoplasma and a phytoplasma lacks a cell wall. It's spread by an insect vector. And I'll show you this little critter in a moment. And we now call it lethal bronzing for a number of reasons. One is that it's related to lethal yellowing that affected coconut palms. So this is the insect that transmits the disease, Haplaxius crudus. And it can get around in four different ways. So that complicates trying to manage it. First, you could have a palm that's already infected and it gets moved or relocated to another setting. Secondly, uh, it may not be infected, but it may have an insect that carries the disease that moves with it. Third, the insect can travel on its own, that they're not strong flyers, but they can get blown around by the wind or hitchhike on cars. Or the phytoplasma can also occur in other plants, which seems strange, but um, that's what happened in, in Jamaica with the lethal uh, yellowing. They found that the disease was in plants other than the coconut palms. So in terms of the symptoms, the first symptom is that the flowers or the, um, if there has fruit, they will, the flowers will die and the fruit will drop off. Now, if you've over pruned your palms and cut off all your bloom stalks, you're not gonna see that symptom. Uh, the next symptom is the bronzing of the older lower leaves. And I'll show you that in a minute. And that bronzing progresses upward towards the spear leaf. Eventually the spear leaf, which is the upright, the youngest, newest leaf that points straight upward will collapse. And then Dr. Bader calls it, the, the next is the woodpecker phase because the tree is gonna die.
So here you can see at the very bottom, the kind of tan colored leaves that we associate with the normal dying of the plant. But the leaves more in the middle have this sort of strange bronzy color. They're not as, uh, not as gray and they have a little bronze tint to them. And here you can see it moving up into the canopy. And uh, I think in this one, those spear leaves already collapsed. So again, the spear leaf is the center. When the leaves emerge in the center, um, they're tightly folded and, and look like a spear. And then the woodpecker phase is at the end of this. Now, if you suspect you have uh, lethal bronzing, there is a test. Uh, it's a little complicated. You need to get a drill. It needs to be sterilized so you're not getting any other genetic material. You need to drill into the tree and remove some of the material, put it in a plastic bag. Then you got to keep it on ice. You got to ship it overnight to one of two addresses. And um, I think it costs about $75. The price may have changed. So needless to say, a lot of people don't get the testing. Uh, but if you're interested in it, this is the publication you can find online that'll teach you how to do it. There are other reasons palms can die. So what's the prognosis? Well, if you had a super valuable palm, uh, a rare one for some reason or another species, you can inject it every um, three months with oxytetracycline. Um, but uh, that may simply be holding off the disease. In other words, it doesn't really cure it. It just keeps it from taking over. And obviously that's completely not feasible uh, for most people. And um, you end up with the tree riddled with holes where you've been drilling into it. So it's, I don't think it's a particularly realistic solution. Once it's diagnosed as having the uh, lethal bronzing, it's fatal. So if, if you have a positive test, you should get it out there. Now, once all the leaves have died and there's no green, you know, the spear leaf collapsed, all the others are dead, it does not pose a problem, a threat to other trees. The insect cannot or will not pick up the disease from a completely dead tree. It's, it's that middle stage when it's been infected and then if more of the little haplaxias feed on it, then they could move it to another plant. So ideally, you'd like to identify it early and remove it. And if you fail and end up with just a dead tree, you don't need to worry about it. You, can, you actually can leave it for the woodpeckers. Now, uh, cabbage palms can be invasive. And uh, uh, some people are surprised for me to say that. Some people believe that native plants can't be invasive. Uh, but they clearly can. Um, let's see. Well, that does not want to advance, which is interesting. I'm going to stop sharing and come back in and see if I can get back to this point. Let's try this again. Okay, so here's Mrs. KLJ. I forget, this is like from the 20s or 30s. This was a news clipping I found. And Mrs. KLJ of Tampa says, she has sable palms spring up all over her yard. Some have grown to be from five to eight feet in height. She asks what's the easiest way to get rid of them. They're very difficult to dig up by the roots. She hopes someone can tell her something that will kill the tree and also rot out the trunk quickly. So this is a photograph I took in our neighborhood. What looks like grass. Oh, no, we you can't see. The, you can't. No. Okay. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? I'm going to back out even further. Um, let me close this. I'm going to uh, oh share. And where did that go? Hold on a sec, let me put on my specs here. Um, we can see your screens now. Yeah, but you, you can't see the through. screen we want to see at Northport. Why, where did that go? Let me, let me look. Um, 
Here, this is the. Okay, let's try this again. Can you see there that? You go. Yep. You got let's it. See if, let's see if it advances. So again, these are these are not this is not grass. These are baby cabbage palm seedlings. Now this is something I see in my neighborhood. These are cabbage palms that are a little older. They've just come up in the um, in the lawn area. And as the woman in Tampa mentioned, these are you cannot pull one of these up. I mean, Superman couldn't pull one of these up. They they have a very extensive root system. And so um, you can't pull them up. They can be killed with herbicide, but they don't necessarily die with herbicide. And a lot of people don't like to use herbicides. If you cut them off, they just re-sprout. So then you end up in a situation like this. Now you can see this neighbor, um, my, my suspicion is that this neighbor has a pair of pruning shears or lopping shears. They're not people that either own or feel comfortable using a chainsaw. So all they can do is cut the leaves off as they come out. And uh, as you can see in the various stages, uh, they just keep throwing up new leaves. So um, then that eventually you know, leads to this kind of situation. So uh, um, they will, you know, they will start to take over a setting. If all you have is uh, pruning shears uh, and you can't pull them out, you can't mow them down, uh, you could end up with a lot of cabbage palms. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I'll tell you why. Here's a cabbage palm and I think this was at a Lowe's. Somebody had uh, put a bench there, I guess for spouses to wait or who knows what, uh, who hangs out at a Lowe's, but anyway, uh, this is a volunteer. You can't really successfully plant a cabbage palm that small. So this, they probably had some, uh, you know, ligustrum or something planted in that little end cap of that aisle. And uh, that didn't make it. And this palm germinated and it's growing up. And in a few years, it'll provide shade for the people that are sitting in that bench, uh, no expense to Lowe's. Here's a setting in uh, downtown Sarasota where there's only a few feet between this blank white wall and uh, parking uh, spaces. Now, there's one live oak way over on the right, but the majority of what's come in there are cabbage palms and they're uh, intercepting rainfall, they're producing oxygen. And in my mind, they look better than staring at a blank wall. So the fact that they um, will come in on their own is, is both a curse and a blessing. Now, I want to talk a little bit about cabbage palms in Northport. This is obviously not a portion of the talk that I sh share with everyone. I sort of worked this up uh, specifically for Northport. And I'm going to start in the Nona Spring area. Uh, you probably all know that Nona is a very important archaeological site. And you can see the spring there on the left. And then all those little uh, uh, poofs, the little top nuts are the tops of the, the canopy of the cabbage palms around the spring. So uh, this is a 1948 aerial image of, that includes uh, section 33 of that township. And that, that blue dot there is where the uh, spring is. And you can see that there were, there were these flowways up in the north, they're kind of sloughs. Uh, sloughs are open, um, you know, a, a marshy, water course that lacks a defined channel. And then as it comes down, you can see there's more and more vegetation along the sides, uh, quite a bit of what appear to be trees. So this is what it looked like in 1948. And eventually we're gonna look more closely at that rectangle, but first let's look at what it looks like today. This is the same uh, setting today. There's that square I mentioned, there's the 33 that we saw, and that blue dot represents where uh, Nona Spring is. So if we zoom in, we can see again dots. Now the 1948 aerial is not particularly high resolution. They're a little muddy looking, but they're there. And if we look at it today, we see a neighborhood and the majority of the tree vegetation are cabbage palms. 
Now, if you lived in that neighborhood, which apparently is Garbutt Terrace and Jody Avenue and Cummings Road and Geary Terrace, um, that the trees you're starting out with there uh, are cabbage palms. Now, if uh, I don't think this is anywhere near the, uh, so this is obviously if it's near Nona, it's nowhere near the estates, but uh, if there was to be a flood here, the cabbage palms would do fine. If there was to be a fire, um, there's probably a really high fuel load in those blocks. And that's because there ha hasn't been fire recently in these areas. So if a fire were to start in any one of these, it would kill the, any oaks probably that are there. It would kill any pines and all the cabbage palms would come back. So at least in this region of Northport, this is a very important canopy tree. Now there is a question, you can see those three lots up near the top. There's a question of uh, how much, how can you develop your lot and retain the tree cover because of the size of the lots and the requirements for the drain field, et cetera. But um, the basic point is, it, at least in this portion of Northport, the cabbage palms are an incredibly uh, important part of the canopy. And uh, just to zoom in a little more. So, so these are really the same cabbage palms we were seeing in 1948. They're just older and taller. Obviously, there's some new ones that have come in here. But and then I want to talk a little bit about Mayakahatchee. This, again, is a 1948 aerial. Now, uh, in 1948, Big Slough or Mayakahatchee had already been dredged for a number of decades. I think it started back in the late 20s. And so what you're seeing here is, is this pale or white colored area is where the slough was. Um, and the slough, again, was an area that lacked trees. It would have been an open marshy area. Uh, a good part of the year, it would have been wet, might have dried out at some point, um, uh, but no trees and no channel. So the dredging, uh, the ditching that took place there actually created the first channel in the, in the slough. And then you can see isolated wetlands uh, all sprinkled around it. And there we go. So this is the outline of the current uh, park. And so enlarged, you see it, and you're probably all familiar with the park, walked along it. And down here, you see the red trail. Now this portion where the red trail is, and if we go back, uh, that's in it. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in this little notch, this is the only part of the park that historically had trees. All the rest of the park originally was open marshy uh, territory. We can see your cursor. You, you can or cannot? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Okay, so here's the red trail and it wanders around through that cabbage palm area. And you notice there's this strange little pie slice of a lot with this gentleman's house here. And there's a long ditch that drains in that way. And so if we zoom in, here's, here's the house. Uh, this is all where the red trail is running through. And you can sort of see like they're more, maybe if we get in closer, it looks like in this area, there are more oaks and maybe pines over here. And this is the cabbage palm area. Well, this is what it looked like in 48. So there was a big wetland over here. The house apparently um, got built more or less in the wetland. Um, and then this is an area where the cabbage palms were and they, they look like they weren't quite as tall then. So they may have been coming in after that initial um, dredging. So this is, uh, if, you, if you walk the red trail, you find this kind of prehistoric looking situation with these really old tall cabbage palms growing in there. And again, this area would probably benefit from a fire and the trees would live. So just to backtrack for a second, I told you that um, how uh, problematic it was when they over prune the cabbage palms. And yet we know from experience that even when they over prune them, the trees survive. So you ask yourself, how can that be? Jono just told me that you're taking away the majority of the tree's ability to function. And yet uh, if you come back in two years or however many months later, uh, it, the tree will have recovered. Well, the reality is that these cabbage palms 
uh, we're living in Florida, which is, as you know, is uh, a lightning capital of the world. Historically, there were many lightning strike fires and before the advent of roads that functioned as fire breaks, fires would spread for miles and miles. And so the, all the plants that grew in these fire, frequent fire areas had to have a strategy. So I showed you the images of the fire consuming the palms. It burns off all the brown leaves and it cooks or roasts uh, the green leaves and then the trees re-sprout. So the palm tree starts to be pre-adapted for heavy pruning. It's a, it's a tree that uh, has the ability to recover from having virtually all of its outer leaves killed and then it will regenerate from its one bud in the center. And so it's that resilience that the tree has in order to cope with the frequent fire situations that enable it to recover uh, from, from heavy pruning. But that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean it's a picnic for the tree. It, it takes a lot of work to grow a whole new canopy. So I think it is abusive, uh, but the explanation for why the tree can recover lies in the setting in which it finds itself in a fire, frequent fire setting. So uh, uh, now we get to Northport's burning question. And that is our cabbage palm trees. I don't know why this is so controversial, but um, let me wade in here. So this is a document from the US Forest Service. Um, it was written by some folks. Uh, Gilman was associated with the, uh, at UF. And um, it's sort of a fact sheet about cabbage palms. And so if you look at the words that say they can get 90 feet tall and they've got a rough fibrous trunk and blah, blah, blah. And then it says, this is South Carolina and Florida state tree. So um, it's pretty clear that it is Florida and South Carolina state tree. In South Carolina, they're referred to as palmettos, which is why my book is called the Palmetto Book, because I was hoping to sell a few in South Carolina. Um, but some people say, well, that's the dang legislature for you. They don't know what they're talking about. They, they made it the state tree, but maybe it's not a tree. So you can't, can't trust the legislators. Oh, here's IFAS, UF IFAS gardening solutions. Um, and the first paragraph, which I will uh, enlarge for you, says nothing says Florida like a palm tree. So it's fitting that the state tree is a sable palm. Oddly enough though, the sable palm is not a true tree. And as a palm, it's more closely related to grasses. Well, luckily they pointed out that it's not a grass, that it's just related to grasses. And then again, they point out that it was designated the state tree in 1953. So they're saying both, yeah, it's the state tree and it's not really a tree. So then here's another IFAS website, Ask IFAS. Uh, and if you read this, it says the sable palm or cabbage palm is native to Florida and the coastal regions, North and South Carolina and it's a state tree. Great, that, that we knew that. Now here's the 4-H forest resources. This is what we're teaching our children. So it says, although it doesn't produce true wood like a tree, the cabbage palm is a tall iconic symbol of Southeastern coastal environment and has therefore been named the state tree of both Florida and South Carolina. So this, in one sentence, these people are telling you they're not really trees, but they have been named state trees in two states. That's, that's the take home message. And that seems like that's enough, okay, let's go with that. But if you go, if you scroll down in that same document, here's what it says. Today, the most common use for cabbage from is a landscaping tree. The plants are slow to grow from seed, so full grown trees. So having told you in the first paragraph that they're not trees, now they're going ahead like a few sentences later and telling you there are trees. And they said the cabbage palm is a medium sized tree. So even this website is conflicted. They both, they want it both ways. They want to say that it's not really a tree and also simultaneously it's a tree. So here's an article I would recommend to you. This uh, was by Sarah Edelman at Fairchild Tropical Garden. And I, I'm not going to read the whole article to you, but you can look it up. It's called Are Palms Trees or Maybe Large Woody Herbs? 
And she asked the questions, are palms trees? And writes, it all depends on how you define a tree. And none of these definitions gives a clear cut answer. So that seems pretty honest. And she says, botanists define trees narrowly as woody plants with secondary growth. Now, secondary growth is when the tree grows two ways. It grows upward, which is primary growth, which we probably think is essential for something to be a tree. And secondary growth is growing outward where the trunk gets wider with time. And as I pointed out in the early slides, the trunk of a cabbage palm, once it comes out of the ground, it doesn't increase in size. So palms like secondary growth in wood, they create tough wood like cacodermis. According to the botanical definition, palms are not trees, but large woody herbs. So, you know, if you, if you brought guests down Florida and drove around and said, would you look at those large woody herbs? They would be pretty confused because um, people think of them as palm trees, but let's move on. And it even mentions they're related to the grasses. So while well, botanists define trees narrowly, ecologists define trees broadly. In ecology, a tree is any plant that functions as a tree, providing habitat and shade, producing leaves and flowers, stabilizing soil, maintaining biodiversity, and helping with climate control. So this is a functional approach. Uh, if, it, if it acts like a tree, it's probably a tree. And if we follow this definition, all erect palms can be defined as trees. So by erect palms, I mean a, a palm with a trunk that goes up and has some height to it, not those little sable miners and sable petonias that I was showing you, but with a real trunk. And then an alternative definition used by foresters is any plant that's above a certain height to use for lumber. Now, you cannot go to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot and get a cabbage palm two by four, but I will tell you, and I could have included in this slideshow, the oldest occupied residence in Volusia County it was built in the 1880s. It's a two-story building with eight rooms and it's built from cabbage palm logs. Uh, the corner posts are pine, but all the walls in the building are cabbage palm logs and it's in pretty good shape. And, you know, probably many of you have been to Mayak River State Park and seen the cabins that, if not the cabins, the little picnic shelter and some of the rustic bathrooms they have. Those were built in the 1930s. So, yes, cabbage palms can be used to build structures from, and uh, if you keep them out of the rain, they do really well. So she goes on and says, uh, none of these definitions is truly functional for palms. Now, part of the problem with palms is palms appear in three different functional forms. They have, some species of palms are tree-like and are tall and have their canopies up at the canopy level. Some are shrubs like the sable etonia and sable minor, and some are vines. Um, if you ever have a rattan furniture, rattan is uh, a palm that's a vine that clambers around. Uh, you've probably seen saw palmettos. You would not consider those trees. So uh, palms can come in different forms. So are palm trees? Some certainly are and fit the definition. She mentions royal and coconut palms. Well, then she says, more important than whether the palms are trees, is how much do these definitions matter? Sometimes the definition is important. Usually uh, rigid definitions are not needed. Just enjoy your backyard beauties and leave your dictionary inside. So there's her name, Sarah Edelman, and uh, you can find it. It was a Miami Herald article. And so you may remember that these two smiling twins, they were uh, advertising certs and they argued about whether it was a breath mint or candy mint. A cabbage palm is both a tree and not a tree. If you don't want to think it's a tree, you can go ahead and you will find people to support you. If you'd like to think it's a tree, you will find uh, lots of field botanists um, and the U.S. Forest Service. Um, the, the cover of the trees of Florida has a cabbage palm on it. There are a lot of botanists that work in the field that believe they're trees. There are a lot of botanists that work in the lab and just work on taxonomy who say they can't possibly be trees. 
So the question is, well, which camp do you want to fall in? Do you want to be a person that um, argues they're trees or a person that argues they're not trees? So here's what I say. If you want to be able to bulldoze cabbage palms with impunity and leave them unprotected, then you need to go with the taxonomists who don't want them to be considered trees. But if you want to recognize their unique functions for shade, oxygen, pollinators, and other wildlife, and accept the fact that along with oaks and slash pines, cabbage palms represent the third crucial component in Northport's native canopy, then you need to side with the, with the ecologists and the field botanists who view them as trees. Now, uh, this is the book I told you about. It has 24 chapters, 312 pages, 25 pages of citations. So it, uh, I, I back up the claims and facts that I put in the book, but it is not an academic book. Um, if you go to Amazon and read the reviews, you'll see that people say it's very readable and accessible. It's getting uh, high ratings on Amazon. And it's a collection of um, stories, really, different 24 different chapters that talk about um, different aspects of the cabbage palm. Some have to do are more botanical. Uh, some have to do with uh, their role in the environment, how long they live and how they lose their fronds and that sort of thing. And then some deal with the social aspects of uh, building with them or harvesting the swamp cabbage. And we can talk about that when we get to questions. I do have a blog called Welcome to the Palmetto Book and All Things Cabbage Palm, but to get there, you just um, you, you type in palmettobook.blog and that will take you there. And I, I try to keep, update and keep information, news stories and other things about cabbage palms. And there's a sample chapter there. You can read if you wanna read a sample chapter. I'm on Instagram if you want to look at my photographs. If you want to email me, um, you can email me. The book can be found at Amazon. Um, I think I asked Barbara if Northport had a bookstore, and I think it doesn't. Uh, they may have a copy at the library, uh, but you can order it from the University of Florida Press or from Amazon. And so uh, this is the time for questions and I'll put that screen back up. So if you wanna write down information about how to contact me and uh, now I'd be happy to respond to if not actually answer your questions. Okay, we do have a couple of questions. So we'll start at the top. Um, okay, we know Native Americans that lived in Florida use sable palms for many things. Can you speak to that? And specifically, is there any historical evidence that the costa slash frond was used as a weapon or spear? Oof, uh, I don't know of any, um, I, I don't know of any, I haven't seen anything that suggests the um, costas were used as spears. Um, so there's a series of engravings made by a gentleman named Lemoyne, and they are the earliest images that got to Europe of what life was like in Florida. And they depict a, a settlement uh, with a stockade with vertical um, logs surrounding a, a, an encampment. Um, and it's impossible to tell from the drawing whether those logs are supposed to be cypress logs, pine logs, or cabbage palm logs. So we don't know if, if they may have used cabbage palms in that manner. Now, we, it's, let, me go, let me start with the swamp cabbage. Um, there's a big book on Florida ethnobotany. And if you look through that massive thing, uh, the author says that it is unlikely that the Native Americans were eating swamp cabbage, hearts of palm, cabbage palm, whatever you want to call it, before the arrival of metal axes from Europe. And that's because if you had to cut a cabbage palm down with a conch shell or a, uh, a, uh, you know, a piece of agate or something, the amount of energy expended in cutting the palm down would uh, far exceed any nutritive value you could get from eating the heart. So they think it really, that 500 years ago is maybe about when they started uh, eating it. Uh, by the same token, they could have been building with cabbage palms. And the reason for that is that 
if you've been to Egmont Key or Kea Costa or you've canoed down the Mayaka River, you know that it's common for palms to fall in when they're eroded. And so if you wanted to build some sort of crude log fort out of palm logs uh, and you were close to a, a beach where they were eroding or a river, uh, then you would just need to figure out a way to uh, roll them or lift them and carry them to your um, where you were. Now, they um, fairly quickly, and I, I don't have the timing on this, um, it's clear that both the Native Americans and then early white settlers uh, relied on cabbage palms for thatch. And there's a quote in the book from uh, Chief Billy who talks about the, the practice of simply sitting under a cabbage palm in a rainstorm and letting the, the leaves collect the water overhead. Um, and obviously you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't need to be uh, too insightful to figure out that if the leaves were keeping you dry in a rainstorm when they were attached to the tree that you cut, cut them off the tree and, and um, use them so, uh, for roofing, so for thatch. So there's a chapter in the book that deals with uh, thatch and um, uh, both the Native Americans and, as I said, early settlers, and it's easy to find old photographs of fishermen's shacks, uh, schoolhouses, and other buildings that uh, Anglo or European settlers had constructed that have a palm thatch roof and palm thatch walls as well. The Native Americans, the Seminoles, uh, were not that big on walls, apparently. The traditional chicky has a thatched roof, but open sides, and then they would build a platform, a low platform, maybe, I don't know, a couple of feet off the ground. And so if there was high water, they could retreat to that platform, they could sleep there and work there. Um, and that, that platform would be constructed of palm logs as well. So um, I think, I think um, to summarize, they probably used cabbage palms for a number of things before Europeans arrived. And once Europeans arrived, there was probably an explosion of uh, using them in novel ways and also eating the, um, eating the hearts of palm. Okay, next question is, when it comes to the pruning of the trees, it seems like landscapers are not required to be trained to cut them properly. Do you know why that is? Well, I, I touched upon that. And I think what's going on is it's, I think, a, well, there are two things. One is, as I noticed, the prior recommendations allowed people uh, to, to prune at least up to the horizontal line. But the more of the explanation and I, that I mentioned is that, um, so imagine this scenario, You're, you have a landscaping business uh, you, you're called out to a homeowner association or, or an individual home, and uh, the owner tells you, I want you to prune my palms to look like Frank's over there on the other lot. And the landscaper says, well, you know, that's really contrary to our adopted professional standards. And then the homeowner says, well, look, do you want my business or don't you? I want my trees to match my neighbors. I don't, I just got here and I think, uh, you know, I'm sensitive to what the local aesthetic is and everyone seems to prune the heck out of these things. So uh, either prune them the way the neighbors are or I'll find a new landscaper. Well, so in that situation, the landscaper says, okay, all right, I'll, you know, I'll take your money. Uh, it may not be my preference, but I'll do it. Uh, and the other part of that is the more severely, once they're up in that bucket truck, the more severely they prune the tree, the less often they have to come back. So let's say you have a contract with them to um, uh, treat your lawn with herbicides, to rake up or blow leaves around and remove dead limbs or whatever, and to prune the palm trees. Well, it's a real pain and it's very dangerous to get up in those bucket trucks takes a lot of time. So you may be coming, whatever, every two weeks or every month to do basic yard maintenance, but you don't want to get the bucket truck out every month. So when you have the bucket truck or the ladder out, you overdo it and get kind of ambitious so that you won't have to be engaged in that kind of activity for another year or something. 
So I think that's, I think it's an expeditious thing on the part of landscapers um, to minimize the number of times they have to do that because it's, uh, it's very expensive for them. And again, very high risk. It's a, it's a whole section in one of the chapters about how many people are killed and injured um, pruning trees. Landscaping work and tree pruning in particular is one of the more dangerous jobs in the US. And um, so that the, to the extent they can minimize that, uh, they would eliminate that risk. Uh, but just to me, just sort of makes the argument like, why are we even bothering to do this? Eventually the frond will fall off and your five-year-old kid could drag it out to the curb and why subject anyone to the risk and the liability of uh, putting them in that bucket truck when a number, you know, if you imagine, imagine from that scenario you watched earlier, imagine he's there with his holding a chainsaw with one hand and then uh, a rat jumps out of the fronds or a wasp nest is encountered and he starts flailing around with a chainsaw. Um, the potential for mayhem is significant. So um, I think that's really, those are some of the reasons why. I think another inadvertent factor is a lot of people um, move into new housing developments where the palms were just planted. And if you move into a subdivision and the palms only have uh, six or seven fronds, you might assume that's what they're supposed to look like. And let's keep them looking the way the way they did when we moved in here. So I think there are a number of factors that contribute to it. And um, it's a shame to see people uh, dying and being injured and, and hurting the trees in the meantime. And eventually I hope to have a, a sort of a campaign with a sort of logo and some material that uh, people can distribute, particularly to their homeowner associations to try and get them to save the expense and the liability of this over pruning and spend their money in other ways. That would be awesome. Thank you for that. Those explanations I hadn't heard before, especially the one about people moving into new developments that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, next question. How prevalent is this bronzing disease? Uh, it's in the majority of the counties in Florida. Uh, it's definitely in Sarasota County. Um, uh, it's, it's more common in some areas. Um, I, I need to talk to some of the big landscapers and find out what percent of like how it's affecting their business. Um, uh, I, I can't tell you, I couldn't tell you much about uh, its prevalence in North ports because I don't know, but it's, 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 you should pretty, pretty much assume it's everywhere. Um, it just may not be very, uh, it may be very spotty in some places. And as that one photograph suggested, um, you can see a situation where several trees are dying and all the other ones are healthy. And you look at that and you have no idea, well, if I come back in 20 years, are they all gonna be dead or are the ones that are alive have some, they're healthier, or they have a genetic predisposition to you know, being resistant, we don't know. So, um, it, it, it is sort of the, the weakest link in their story right now, but um, I think they're still, I think they're still a good investment. They're a relatively cheap tree and uh, many places, uh, you know, when you buy them, if you keep them watered, they'll give you a guarantee that they'll come and replace it in a year or whatever, some time frame. So I wouldn't let that discourage people from planting them, but it is a issue and it remains to be seen uh, how big a problem it becomes and what kind of strategies evolve to um, cope with it. And Dr. Bader is working on a number of, uh, at this point, theoretical, but hopefully eventually practical approaches to uh, limiting the spread of the disease. Which leads us to the next question. Is lethal bronzing common for other palm trees other than yes. cabbage palms. Yes, and uh, so, so there are a number of the palms in the date palm family. There's a palm called the Sylvester palm. And these things are big. The, when you drive around, you see the ones with the big fat trunks and the long feathery uh, pinnate leaves. Those are very valuable. Uh, they're grown in nurseries and it takes a long time to get them to a good size. And they are also susceptible to lethal bronzing. So nursery owners are very concerned about this. 
Um, uh, so yes, I, 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 it's not clear that all palms are susceptible. Um, I think if you, if you do a Google search um, for lethal bronzing, you can find some information that suggests the, the species that are most likely to be affected. There, there are probably four or five of them where there's been one instance recorded. And, and again, that may be because nobody has taken the time to you know, sterilize their drill and collect the material. There may be a lot more palms dying from lethal bronzing than were actually being recorded because they've been verified. But yes, uh, there are other species that are affected by lethal bronzing. So that being said, when thinking about the future of the cabbage palm in Florida and clear cut development, are they easily transplantable? Can you move them around a job site from one place to another to try to save some of them? Uh, do you have any input on that? Yeah, how can we? How can we get back to, uh, what are you seeing now? Um, you with your background. Okay, great. Um, yes, they're very easy to transplant. It's, it's strange. It's strange. Um, when you dig up a cabbage palm, all the roots die. So you may see like these ridiculously tiny root balls. Uh, when you see a truck with cabbage palms going by and you look and they go, those things aren't gonna make it. Uh, every single one of those roots will die. And so it has to grow an entire new set of roots. Um, and that's why they prune, when they transplant, that's why they prune you know, 95 or more percent of the leaves off because a tree with no roots can't support many leaves. So the key when you get a cabbage palm is you have to water it very religiously. Um, you need to keep them moist. If you can even spray the leaves, uh, that helps. Um, but so the, that's combined with the other thing that I mentioned, which is they're very slow growing. So you can go to a native nursery. There, there's several in the area and you can buy a cabbage palm seedling in a three gallon pot or a seven gallon pot or whatever you want. But you know, my advice is do not, do not buy a hammock on the same day because it's gonna be 20 years or more before you could even think of hanging anything on it. So they do not grow cabbage palms in nurseries. Uh, the, the native nurseries will sell you a small one uh, for optimists or young people or whatever, but the, all, the, all the cabbage palms you're seeing moved around town are germinating on ranches and the ranchers are allowing landscapers to come and dig these palms up and then move them and plant them in a new location. And so, yes, if you have a lot that's being cleared, if you have a source of water, if there's a well in or you have public water, whatever, you can dig those palms up with a tree spade or by hand, hire people to dig them up, move them to a new location, plant them in a line or plant them in a grove, whatever you want keep them watered and uh, you'll have a high uh, rate of success. So yeah, they're very easy to move around. It breaks my heart to see developers come and chop them down, bulldoze them over, yank them out, send them to the landfill. And then when they're done with the, with the project and they go out and buy a bunch of new cabbage palms and stick them in. And when they could have simply stockpiled those palms on the same property and then moved them over. So. Yeah, they're, they're easy to move around because the, that really small root ball makes them very easy to handle. If you have to move a big oak or a fig or something like that, you've got to have a very large uh, root ball to travel with it, but that's not necessary with a cabbage palm. All right, and we have one last question. Do you know of any recipes that use the tree? <laughs> and I'm assuming that means to, to make the soup, but Right. When, besides making the soup, do, do people cook any other parts of the tree? I, I tacked on no. an additional question there. No, uh, well, you can find references to people that, that, that ground up the seeds and made a paste or something, but seeds are really hard. They're really small. I, I, don't, I, I don't think that there's much of that going on in, in any contemporary sense. The, the two things with the swamp cabbage, um, I, I prefer it raw. Um, it's kind of crunchy. It's sort of like water chestnuts. It's sort of like cabbage. It's mostly a crispy, crunchy, white 
plant material that's fairly innocuous and doesn't have much flavor. The actual um, swamp cabbage that's cooked up is typically, you know, cooked in a broth that might have some butter or some fat back or bacon or it, to me it ends up sort of being like stone soup by the time you're done people have added so many interesting tasty ingredients that um, it would be pretty good without the palm but it, yes in the book um, I referenced uh, I described several different authors and individuals and how they uh, prefer to prepare the swamp cabbage Okay, I do not have any more questions in the chat. Um, so everyone, this is your last chance. If you have anything else you think of right now, type it in. Otherwise, it looks like we are done. Okay, well, Barbara, I wanna thank you and the organization uh, for hosting this. Um, uh, and if, you know, at some point in the future, you'd like me to come back, maybe when we're meeting in person and we could actually talk about the book and I could read a few passages, we could do that. But I thought it was important to just get some of the basic realities of this tree out and available to uh, citizens of Northport. Yes, thank you so much for your time and for adding in the extra couple of slides there about Northport, we really appreciate it. So thank you everyone and uh, we'll have a good night, everybody. Goodbye. Bye.